Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, second session of the Rencontre Théoricien this year. We've had some difficulties in finding uh, in-person speakers uh, lately. Uh, we tried to get one who unfortunately became contact person, so had to cancel his trip. Uh, so we are very grateful to Eran Palti uh, uh, to agree to give this talk on a rather short notice. Uh, speaking from uh, Israel, and he's going to tell us about convexity of charge operators in conformal field theories and the weak gravity conjecture. Eran, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good. Well, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. I'm uh, very happy to do so. And of course, I have very good memories of this seminar series from my many years in Paris. So it's nice to see you all again. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, let me say I cannot see the chat. So if you want to ask questions, just interrupt. Uh, and please do so as much as you want. Uh, it's, I, I, I like it. <laughs> Um, so the title of the talk is uh, Convexity of Charged Operators in CFTs and the Weak Gravity Conjecture. Um, and it's work uh, uh, that came out just over a month ago with um, Ofer Ahawani. So uh, let me uh, begin. So uh, let me begin. So, so the, I guess we've heard a lot about the weak gravity conjecture already, but let me just start from the, the kind of beginning motivation for this um, to run through it. So um, there is an old idea that in quantum gravity, there are no U1 global symmetries. Um, and the simplest argument for this is that uh, a black hole uh, does not reflect any global symmetry charge on its horizon. So if you had some, some, some theory of gravity that has a U1 global symmetry, and you throw some charged matter into a black hole with that global symmetry, then you don't see that on the horizon of the black hole. And uh, at least at least not uh, semi-classically. Um, and therefore, uh, given there is an infinite number of microstates associated with uh, a black hole. So in other words, if you, if you see some black hole in this theory, you don't know what the global symmetry charge of it could be, it could be anything, and therefore you should associate an infinite number of microstates to it. And this is in contradiction with um, uh, the expected finite entropy of black holes due to uh, Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula. Um, okay, so that's, that's a very uh, simple, I think, argument where you don't have U1 global symmetry in quantum gravity. And, you can rephrase this argument a bit. It's essentially the same thing, except now you look at a black hole which has a very low mass, as low as semi-classically possible, so near the Planck scale, uh, as following. So um, if you take a black hole and you throw the charged uh, matter uh, under the UN global symmetry into it, and then you just let the black hole um, Hawking and radiate away its mass, since the horizon doesn't reflect the global symmetry charge, this Hawking radiation cannot discharge any net um, global symmetry, and so you cannot lose any global symmetry charge, and then you let it lose its mass until it leaves the semi-classical regime um, somewhere near the Planck scale, and then what you get is some very light object uh, around the Planck mass, um, which has the same global symmetry charge as the original black hole, and therefore that object is stable because it cannot emit that charge back. It, it's lost all its mass but kept all its charge, and this is called a remnant, it's called the charge remnant. Um, and since you can do this with any number of uh, initial charges for the black hole, you get an infinite number of different stable remnants in the theory. Um, and this is basically the same as an infinite number of microstates at a fixed mass. It all, it all comes because you could throw in um, some, you know, if you have a black hole with certain mass and certain charge, um, you can throw in an, uh, a, a particle that has a U1 global symmetry charge, let a black hole emit by Hawking radiation, the mass of the particle is just ruined, and you come back to yourself, but just with one additional charge. This way, you can create an infinite number of microstates or an infinite number of remnants. Um, and and this is uh, these are related. So, um, sorry, Aran. Yes, these remnants don't have to have the same mass, right? No, they there will be some Planck scale mass. We don't know what that is, but it doesn't really matter because they cannot discharge. Uh, Right, because for example, I mean, this story with remnants, of course, is old, and we all believe probably it's not true, but uh, all the arguments that they shouldn't be there are shaky. 
yeah, it's very hard to prove an inconsistency, but what I just showed is that the argument for the absence of the, the, the remnants is basically the same as the violation of the bekenstein hawken entropy, in the sense that it's just a statement that you can throw in a global symmetry charge, emit the uh, particle global symmetry charge, emit the mass of the particle by Hawking radiation, and you come back to yourself with one additional global symmetry. And uh, that, that's a, that, would lead, that leads to an infinite number of microstates at a fixed black hole mass. Um, and the remnants is just the same thing, except instead of just emitting the particle mass you threw in, you just emit all the mass down to the, sem the end of the semi-classical regime. So I, I think the infinite number of remnants are very directly related to the infinite microstates. So, me. Just one second, sorry. Uh, uh, is it, sorry, is that okay? Did I answer your question or? Well, to a certain degree, but uh, there yeah. is let's, lots of fuzzy stuff, but let's not discuss Yeah, them. Yeah, I this think. is just motivation if you want. Uh, of course, none of these are proofs and uh, eventually we'll reach a conjecture and it's called a conjecture for a reason. But I think this is quite robust actually, this no global symmetry the argument that it violates it, but okay, we can discuss that, yeah. No, in fact, I'm not, uh, my complaint was not about the argument about global symmetries, but the story of the remnants is a bit fuzzy, but let's not right. pursue this. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is one way to think about it, and I think it's a nice way to introduce it because it will lead naturally to, to what I want to say. So, uh, so again, what we can do is, again, it's a rephrasing, but it's not really an exact rephrasing. This is even more, I think the remnants and the violation of the bekenstein hawken entropy, the infinite microstates is very closely related. This one is also related, but not as much. Um, um, instead of uh, forming the infinite number of stable gravitational states by charges, uh, by, 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 by making a black hole and letting it lose its mass, you can just form them from the bottom up. So take those particles, and so this is the following idea. You just take a particle charge under global symmetry and you put it next to a copy of itself. Then um, the only forces that will act on those particles is gravity. And so those two particles will form a bound state. And um, the uh, mass of the bound state, so the charge of the bound state will be twice the charge of the particle, but the mass of the bound state will be a little bit less than twice the mass of the particle because there is some binding energy. And then it's easy to show that if you have an object in your theory, it can only decay to other objects if the mass to charge ratio of the objects that it decays to is smaller than the object itself. And since the bound state has a smaller mass to charge ratio than that of the particle, it cannot decay back to the particle. That's just by charge and energy conservation. So this bound state is completely utterly stable. So it's like, uh, it's like the remnant in that sense, it's a stable state that cannot decay to anything else, completely and utterly stable. And then you can do the same with two particles, with three particles, you just throw in another particle and four and so on and so on. And this way you build up um, uh, the infinite number of completely stable bound states. Eventually you'll reach, of course, the Planck scale and then you, you're kind of in the remnant regime and then in the black hole regimes, but you can just this way build up right from the bottom up the infinite number of stable bound states. Uh, if you have more than one particle in the theory, you just have to take the particle with the mass to charge ratio that's smallest. So you build and, and then you still get these uh, stable states. So this kind of connects the existence of an infinite number of completely stable um, uh, uh, states in the theory um, with, with, with a, 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 the U1 of, due to U1 global symmetry um, with some inconsistency in the theory. Now it's very hard to prove that this, this is really inconsistent, just as you say, even having an infinite number of remnants, it's hard to prove that it's inconsistent, but I think it's quite reasonable to, 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 to believe that. Um, now, if you don't like, if you don't want an infinite number of, of these um, uh, completely stable uh, bound states, what you can do is you can gauge the U1. So if you gauge the U1, then, then the story changes because now you don't just have the attractive gravitational force. When you put the particle next to each other, you also have a repulsive gauge force. Uh, There's a problem. Anybody can hear Aaron or? No problem here as well. No, I think it uh, dropped out. He dropped out. Yeah, he's still on the Zoom and the screen is being, still being shared. So 
happen. But his image is gone too. No. Yeah, the image is gone as well. Let's, let's and now the screen is gone. No, the screen is gone. No, no hopefully he'll be reconnecting. Ah, he will reconnect. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm very sorry. I disconnected. I'm sorry. I, I shared a screen again. All right. Glad to see okay. you back. Yes. Can you see me? Okay. Sorry about that. Sometimes there is some string here. Okay. So uh, if you gauge, we have these things, but uh, these cutoffs go away when the gauge coupling goes to zero. So if you send the gauge coupling to zero, you go back to the same point you started with. Um, then there is no repulsive force and there's no extremality bound. So the story is that if you want a U1 in your theory, you have to gauge it, but you can't just gauge it arbitrarily weakly. If you gauge it arbitrarily weakly, it's just like a global symmetry. That's just the statement that if you have a gauge U1, the same the gauge coupling to zero, it behaves like a global symmetry because there's no propagating degree of freedom, but there is an exact selection rule. So you have to gauge it sufficiently strongly. So what does sufficiently strongly mean? Well, there's only one other player in this game, that's gravity. So sufficiently stronger should be sufficiently stronger with respect to gravity. And then it's kind of clear what. The natural condition to demand is, is that uh, force due to the gauge field is stronger than the uh, attractive force. Um, stronger than the attractive force. Uh, that way you, you, you don't have these stable bound states anymore. And similarly, that means that the particle is such that it allows uh, extremal charged black holes to uh, discharge themselves. They can emit this particle. So I think this is a very natural uh, motivation. Of course, it's not a proof, but uh, this is a motivation for the idea that if you have a gauge symmetry in your theory, you can't just gauge it arbitrarily weakly. You have to gauge it at least as strong as gravity. And, and this is essentially uh, uh, the motivation for what's called uh, the weak gravity conjecture. Oh, sorry, I think I might have a, uh, a slide missing. Yeah, so the weak, uh, uh, just one second, sorry, uh, let me, let me just uh, um, I, I apologize, just one second. Uh, I think when I did the power thing, I, I missed the slide out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. So this is the uh, state. The slide. I, I missed the slide out when I did this new version. So the weak gravity conjecture essentially proposes that this what I just said that um, they should not have stable bound states and stable black holes. Um, and so you should gauge things strongly enough. And what that means is that you must have a charged particle in your theory such that its mass is less than its charge. So that's, that's, that's the motivation for it. So this, this particle means that you don't have these uh, absolutely stable bound states and you don't have these absolutely stable black holes. Um, so are there any questions about this motivation for the weak gravity conjecture or what the weak gravity conjecture is? Um, okay. Can I ask a question yes? um, about, so if you're in four dimensions, the coupling runs? Yes. Which skill should I evaluate the, the coupling for this to make sense? Because you, you're looking about the bound state at the bound state, right? So should it not be that the coupling should be evaluated at a very high skill? Right. So the, so the statement here is that the you you have a mass scale in the in the inequality. So you evaluate it at that mass scale. So this inequality must hold at the energy scale, which is G M Planck. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of physically it makes it's an, it makes sense because, you know, let's say I try to violate this conjecture, okay? Then I look in the IR of my theory and I ask, do I have a particle whose mass is less than uh, G M Planck? I say no. Okay, then I keep going up in energy, and then if I to show that I violated it, I have to reach that energy G M Planck and show I don't have a particle in my theory. So mm -hmm. this this must be evaluated at G M Planck. That's the only thing that makes sense. Um, but G M Planck is very high. Yeah. Well, it depends how big G is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, one over one hundred thirty-seven. 
for the for the yeah so for 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 the standard model this is a very uh, uninteresting statement because uh the weakest gauge coupling it's not actually 137 it's 0 0.3 so like the gauge coupling of the electromagnetic force is 0 0.3 so this is an uninteresting statement in the standard model it tells you you must have some charged particle um basically 0 0.3 times the Planck mass was we know we have the electron already at the few um kv so it's not really um interesting mm -hmm. for the standard model but as a general statement about any quantum field theory it's very surprising because it tells you that um, you get a constraint on your theory when it becomes very weakly coupled. And we expect, it's a constraint from quantum gravity, it involves in Planck. So we expect the opposite typically from a quantum field theory perspective. If you take your theory to be extremely weakly coupled, you expect it to not uh, depend on UV physics, to decouple from UV physics. So. Right, I see. Okay, so, Yeah, so for the standard model, it's not so interesting, but as a general statement, it's very interesting. Um, hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so now we can, now what we want to do is we want to take this logic we just made and, and play with it a bit um, in different scenarios and see, reach different formulations of the weak gravity conjecture. So, um, for the first thing we might ask is say, well, okay, I talked about the gauge repulsive force and the, and the, magnet, and the elect, attractive force due to gravity. What if there's more forces acting on this particle? Well, there's only one other force that can act on a particle. That's a cell force between the particle and itself or a copy in itself. And that's a scalar field mediated particle force. And therefore, um, if you do that, then there's a very natural formulation. If you have massless scalar fields in the theory, then they also mediate a uh, Coulomb force uh, that's comparable to gravity and to, and to the gauge force. And therefore, we see what we should ask is that not only should the repulsive force beat the attractive gravitational force, but it should beat both the attractive forces together. That's how we avoid the bound state. So in other words, um, we should formulate it more generally the weak gravity conjecture is the existence of a particle in the theory which is self-repulsive under all the long-range Coulomb forces. If we do that, then we see we reach this formulation of the weak gravity conjecture, where this is the coupling to any massless scalar fields. So that's one natural generalization. You just take this logic and you apply it in different settings. So that's the uh, that's the idea. Um, so let's now look now do the similar kind of thing. So. So this is the this is the argument we just made, and then of course you may or may not like the general quantum gravity arguments for these. You can think of them as guiding principles, and then of course you can just go and test this in string theory, and that's really one of the strongest pieces of evidence that when we do test them, they seem to be correct. So here's an example of some tests in string theory. Um, so this dots are the spectrum of particles that you find in in the string construction, and this is very very typical to many string constructions. And you see here is the charge of the particles. Um, here is the mass of the particles, and then uh, you know the dots lie above this 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 red dotted line. That means that the charge is bigger than the mass. Um, but then you also have mass of scalar fields, so you have the full attractive forces due to gravity and scalar fields is the blue line, and then you see the red dots are particles which are self repulsive. So for which the repulsion gauge force is bigger than both the attractive gravitational and scalar force together. So indeed, the conjecture is satisfied in this spectrum. And there's some interesting things we can see that are also very general. Uh, the self-repulsive particles, um, there's not one of them, but many of them. Usually there's an infinite number of them. And secondly, the charge starts at something that's order one. Um, so um, yeah, and so these past tests in string theory, we see that indeed we, we have a self-repulsive particles and there's actually no violation found to date of the weak gravity conjecture in string theory. Now Sorry, I should um, say, yeah, yes. Uh, what is this, in this parameter mu again for the scalar force? Uh, it's just, it's like the Yukawa coupling. If the particle was a, was a fermion, let's say, then you would just have a fermion, fermion scalar. Okay. Yeah. yeah, like in this, you know, the self force here goes like a Yukawa, it's like a Yukawa force, uh, except if it's a massive scalar, it goes like a Coulomb force, but it's just the Yukawa coupling, yeah. Actually, more generally, mu is actually the derivative of the mass of the particle with respect to the scalar field, so where the mass is the coefficient in the Lagrangian that comes in front of the quadratic term in the particle. That's but roughly speaking, that's yeah, in roughly speaking, gravity theories, you mean, or, or sorry, that's in supergravity theories, or is no, in general. So, in general, mu has a general formula for it that 
you look in the Lagrangian at the coefficient in front of the quadratic term of the particle, the sort of what you would call the mass, but it doesn't have to be constant. It could be a function of scalar fields. I see. Yeah, the okay. derivative of that is mu. If it's not a function of a particular scalar field, that means the scalar field doesn't couple to it. It doesn't contribute to this Coulomb force. Yeah. yeah. So I should say it is difficult to test that we go to just in non supersymmetric settings. So um, that's, of course, uh, an issue that we have to face because it's difficult to construct non supersymmetric vacuum and spring theory. But um, uh, in general, all the, all the tests done so far ha have passed it. So um, this, this, uh, that's what we have. Okay, so now we go on to the, the, the subject of this talk, really, um, which is um, what do we do when we want to apply the weak gravity conjecture and to the city space? Okay, so if we now think about this uh, logic we just said, well, um, in uh, flat space, the only things that appeared in the formulation of the weak gravity conjecture were the long range Coulomb forces. And that's because you could take the particle and its copy and put them an infinite distance away from each other. And then the only forces that act on it are the long range Coulomb forces due to massless fields. Um, however, in anti sitter space, you can't do that anymore. It essentially acts like a box. So you can only put, you can only separate the particle from its partner so much. And this means that there's no natural separation between the long range Coulomb forces and other forces that act over length scales that have ordered the ADS radius. So we should try to reformulate it. It, it doesn't make so much sense in anti sitter space. And this is what we propose should be the formulation of the weak gravity conjecture in anti sitter space. Um, we essentially just insist that the binding energy should be positive. That's essentially what we're asking for, that there's no bound states. So we call this the positive binding conjecture. And it says that for a weakly coupled gravitational theory with U1 gauge field, there should exist at least one charged particle in the theory with charge of order one, which has a non-negative self-binding energy. Okay, so if you take that definition, you can apply it in flat space. Then you take the particle and it's copy an infinite distance away from each other, the non-negative self-binding energy is the same statement that the particle should be repulsive under long-range forces. It's exactly the same thing. But in ADS, it's no longer true. It's a really different formulation, and I'll show that in a second. Were there any questions? Or? Yeah, Rana, I have a question. How yes? do you define binding energy in a box? So it's the difference between the lowest energy two-particle state and the twice the energy of the one-particle state. How do you separate the two-particle state from one-particle state in a box? Yeah, so, okay, so for, it depends what the theory is. If it's a weakly coupled theory, then, you know, two particle states can be separated from one particle state. Um, uh, if, you if you want, you can say this, if you want to make it rather, in fact, we will talk about this issue because in, in the CFT dual, you can't separate the two and we're formulated in a way which doesn't differentiate between two particle and one particle states. But if you want to, you can just say, let me take a theory with a charge one particle in it then I look at the lowest energy charge two state, take away twice the energy of the charge one state. That's, that's a sharp definition. Is that okay? Or you can also ask what happens if I have two particles, one to charge one and one to charge two, then how do I differentiate between, but we can discuss that if you want as well. Or... Uh, there are also other subtleties, but let me think about it. Yeah, so that, that's the way to define it. In fact, when we go to the CFT, that's, you can define it precisely that way. Uh, that is what I just told you in terms of the charge. You don't differentiate between one particle and two particle states. Yeah. But if it's a weakly coupled theory, you, you can also differentiate between them. I mean, uh, they have different lifetimes and things like this. I mean, we do have a notion of particle numbers in weakly coupled theories. Um, but yeah. So, so this is, so how is this different to the weak gravity conjecture in ADA space? Let's see in action what we just talked about. So let's consider this, for example, this five dimensional theory in ADS space. So it has gravity, a cosmological constant, gauge field, this scalar field is the charged particle, uh, has a mass. Um, and in the normal formulation of the weak gravity conjecture, the only things that play a role are the gauge coupling, the mass of the particle, and that's it, and, uh, and Planck. Um, there are no massless scalar fields here. I've, I've just taken restricted to a simpler thing. So the normal weak gravity is just a formulation between the gauge coupling and the, and the mass. But now we're saying, no, we should calculate the binding energy and insist that that's positive. Well, these terms in the action also contribute to the binding energy. So you can add a phi to the four and a phi squared del phi squared. And actually these are the only terms at two derivative levels that contribute to the binding energy. Um, so phi to the six doesn't, for example. So it's, a, it's, it's something that's not impossible to calculate. So you take a theory like this and you calculate the binding energy where A and B are some coefficients. 
And luckily this was done already in this paper for us very nicely. And this is the result that they find. The binding energy corresponds to contribution from the photon, uh, photon exchange, uh, graviton exchange, and there's this quartic couplings. So, so remember, if you have a quartic term, it's a, it's a contact term. So it, it, it corresponds, it's only non-vanishing if there's a non-trivial wave function overlap between the particle and this copy. And if in flat space, you can infinitely separate them, so there's no wave function overlap. Um, in ADS space, you have a wave function overlap, so it has a non-trivial contribution. And this is the result that they find where I just replaced the mass of the particle by this parameter delta, which we'll see um, uh, what that means in a second. Um, and uh, for supersymmetric theories, you can even show that A and B is all the one. So there is actually no separation between these three contributions. And the positive binding conjecture demands that this binding energy should be bigger than zero. So you see that this is really qualitatively and quantitatively different to the weak gravity conjecture because um, uh, you have this uh, extra term, which is not small in any sense. Um, and BPS states exactly satisfy that the binding energy is zero. So BPS states satisfy that this whole thing is zero, not that graviton and photon is zero. And that, that therefore would suggest that this is indeed the correct natural formulation of the weak gravity conjecture. Um, are there any questions about this, this proposal for ADS space? Uh, yes. Um, can you map the binding energy to something on the boundary? Yeah. So this is this is the, the subject of the talk. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll do that in a second. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions about the gravity side? Um, so okay. what you said about yeah. BPS particles, for, uh, is there some supersymmetric unitarity bound that by issue this, or I guess not because these are two particle states. Are there unit unitarity bounds which guarantee that the binding energy is zero? Yes, yeah, there's some. If there's some BPS bound that is saturated, then uh, usually a BPS bound doesn't come out of nowhere, right? It, it must be. Positive. Yes. It, it, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, uh, BPS states are marginally, you know. Um, they are like marginal bound states. So right, but also, yeah. Follow? Does it follow from supersymmetry that this gamma is? Yeah, it's like an n equals two. The BPS state in n equals two supersymmetry will will exactly satisfy gamma equals zero. But does it follow from supersymmetry that for all other states, then gamma is positive? Ah, okay. No, I mean it doesn't. I mean, well, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, no, no, no. And typically, in fact, it goes the other way around. So like, if you think of a typical, let's say we think of flat space or something and forget about this quartic terms, then you know, a BPS state would be such that the photon and graviton exactly cancel. So the gravitational attraction exactly cancels the repulsion. Um, so this, this would be zero, but then a non-BPS state has gravity bigger than, has a mass bigger. Hmm. It has the same charge as a BPS state, but a mass bigger. So it will actually be attractive. So it's like an anti-BPS bound in that sense, the weak gravity conjecture. Okay. Is that so? Yeah. So non BPS. Actually, it's more subtle than it's not just anti BPS because when you have scalar fields, these contributions, the BPS bound relates only the charge and the mass. Uh, it doesn't really, it relates what it relates is the central charge and the mass. And the central charge is not equal to the charge if you also have scalar fields in the story I and quartic term. So it's more subtle than what I just said, but roughly speaking, it's like an anti BPS bound. So, yeah. All right. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, but sorry, uh, Erin. Also, yes. I thought that uh, what is important is not really the quantized charge in this, but is the uh, is the force, and the force also depend on the scalar. It's not the quantized charge, so, so it was more like the central charge rather than the yeah. It is a central charge. Yeah. So that, what I just said is true if there's no scalar fields. So if there's no scalar fields, the only I'm including scalar fields. Uh, yeah, so if you include scalar fields, then it's not exactly an anti BPS bound. Yeah. So you can have non BPS states which satisfy it because there is also a scalar contribution. But the force will depend on the scalar, it's not the quantized charge rate. So, so it, it's yeah. it's related to the central charge directly. So you don't see why you change. So I don't so maybe I I I I can go back to the scalar field case in flat space before. So this is what a BPS bound looks like. This it's saturated by BPS states. 
So the gauge, the gauge force is equal to the gravitational attractive force plus the scalar attractive force. But so the BPS state saturates. You, you, you exactly. disregard completely the dependence in the scalar, so we don't see where the central charge is with respect to. to in this equation, charge. sorry, in this equation. Yes. No, this this mu is the dependence on the scalar. So I have, I don't have it in this slide in this in this thing, but mu is the derivative of the central charge with respect to the scalar. So you know, this is like the classic BPS state, the BPS statement that there is a Q squared is equal to Z squared plus del Z squared. This mu is the coupling to scalar fields. Now what I'm confused about is that it would look like the interaction, the electromagnetic interaction is proportional to the quantized charge, whereas for me it's proportional to the central charge. Uh, but only if you have a single gauge field, no. right? if you have more uh, yeah. charges. It's more complicated. No, of course. It's yeah. not a problem. But they are dressed with scalar field anyway. It's not like the quantized charge with a constant. And no, the, the, the electromagnetic force is not proportional to the central charge. It's This is the relation precisely. The central charge is the mass. And the force is proportional, is equal to the, to the mass, the central so charge, plus BPS the derivative state. of the central charge. Sorry? That's for a BPS state, that the mass is yeah. the central charge. The weight is just greater, right? But, uh, this is what BPS state satisfies exactly this equation, that the electromagnetic repulsion is equal to the gravitational attraction plus the attraction due to scalar fields. And if you write this in terms of the n equals two formula, this is what's called Q squared sometimes. It's the contraction with this symplectic uh, gauge matrix of the charge vector is equal to the central charge squared plus the derivative of the central charge squared. Right? So it's not true that the central charge is proportional to the charge if you have scalar fields. No, of course it's not. Yeah. So I don't, what is the, you seem, you seem unhappy about this equation or? Yeah, yeah, but go ahead. I, I may ask later. I could type it in chat maybe. So I don't, I can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. All right, sorry. Yeah, this is basically what BPS states satisfy. They satisfy no force, not, not that the charge is equal to the mass. Okay, so then let's, so then because we're in ADS, there's also a dual CFT. And so you can ask, what does this binding energy correspond to in a dual CFT? And this is something very nice because it corresponds to something very simple in the dual CFT. It corresponds to what you, you would call the anomalous dimension of the operator due to, due to the field. Uh, this isn't the anomalous dimension in the sense of uh, the, the quantum takeaway classical one. It's the anomalous dimension precisely as I define it here. So the binding energy, so if you take a, an operator in the dual field theory, uh, CFT called phi, which is the operator dual to the field phi. I'm going to call both of them phi. Then delta is the dimension of that operator. Then a binding energy is the dimension of the operator phi squared. Take away twice the dimension of the operator phi. Okay. And that kind of makes sense because the dimension of the operator is the energy of the state. So this is like the energy of the state, which has two phi's in it. Take away twice the energy of the state, which has one phi in it, in, in that sense. Um, okay. Uh, and if you want to make this more precise, then phi squared is the leading operator in the OPE of phi times phi. Oh. So what that's the dual statement. Mean? Yes? What do you mean by leading? Oh, the lowest dimension, sorry. The lowest dimension. Um, this is also, in this definition here, it's also the lowest dimension. So they're actually, yeah, sorry, yeah. Is that okay? Uh, because I, I thought, I mean, uh... Sometimes the OP is seeing, so would this be the operator whose coefficient is, is a constant? That's what I would think is the double trace, right? The multiple decoy in a weakly coupled. No, it, well, it doesn't have to be the double trace in general, actually, but yeah, but, it's but, just lowest dimension. Is the, is the OP of phi with itself singular? So that's the, the conjecture is that it, 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 cannot, it cannot be, but if it was I singular, see, okay. This would be negative, yeah. So another way to phrase it is the statement that the OPE of phi with itself is non-singular. Uh, and and the, sorry, that's the same as saying I, it has a. I see, and and phi is this part. Okay, very good. Thanks. It, it, obviously, obviously, meaning coefficients in front of the one over r. Yeah, yeah. That, the, so that comp, that's not the, the fact that that's not singular is the same as saying that the dual has a positive binding energy. Sorry, uh, uh, is the statement that there exists some charged operator whose OPE is not singular? Is that the statement? 
Yeah, so in the theory I just gave, there's only one such charged operator. Yes, but for general CFD... Yeah, so you, well, I'll make the precise limit for any CFD in, in a second, yeah. But okay. yeah, it's, it's basically that there should exist some charged operator which satisfies something like this. But I'll, I'll talk about this in the next slide. Is that okay? Or, yeah, sure, thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. Any more questions? Or? So, okay, this also answers Elias's question. What is the natural dual to the binding energy? And so it's a very simple quantity. And what we can do is we can write this more generally in terms of the charge of the operator rather than di directly in terms of the field dual that is dual to. So if we, the, 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 the gravity side had a U1 gauge theory and the charge of the field under the U1 gauge theory was Q. So in the dual thing, you're going to have a charge Q under U1 global symmetry. Okay, so the, the dual theory has a U1 global symmetry and you can look at the dimension of the operator of charge 2Q. So the lowest dimension operator of charge 2Q, take away twice the dimension uh, of the operator of charge Q and this should be positive. That's what the binding conjecture proposes. Okay. Uh, Aaron, I have a, a question. Somehow I missed yes? that. Q is a global symmetry at the boundary or, uh, oh, sorry, in, is a global symmetry in the bulk or a local symmetry in the bulk? There is no global symmetry in the bulk. That's what I just said. Okay. okay. <laughs> what I tried to argue. Right. So Q yeah. is a gauge symmetry in the bulk, and it's a global yeah. symmetry on the boundary. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry. One, one more question about this OP. Isn't there the identity appearing in the OP that would have a singular coefficient? Well, not if phi is charged. What? Ah, uh, because you mean... it's phi with itself. I see. Not with the phi dagger. Yeah, no, yeah, no, actually, phi phi dagger behaves completely the opposite way. In fact, you can prove that, I think in supersymmetric theories, you can prove it always has a negative binding energy. Because, you know, a, a particle and, and the oppositely charged particles attract. Right. Well, the particle. And it has always the identity, as Monica said. So, so the identity. Is the... Yeah. And, and then it, that's related to the unitarity that delta phi should be bigger than one. But anyway, yeah. No. So, so, so five 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 bar is, behaves the opposite way, just because. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Or? Okay. So, um, so this is the, this is then the the the, the proper formulation of what I just said. We call this the abelian convex charge conjecture. So consider any CFT with a U1 global symmetry. Denote by delta Q the dimension of the lowest dimension operator of charge Q then this must satisfy a convex-like constraint that the dimension of N1Q0 plus N2Q0 is bigger than or equal to the dimension of N1Q0 plus N2Q0 plus any positive integers at N1 and 2, some Q0 of order 1. So, okay, so we're taking this, uh, this particle to be some uh, order 1 uh, particle, and um, we essentially generalize what I just said. Um, are there any questions about this general formulation? So I don't know how strict you guys are on time, or should should I stick to? Not very exactly. strict. There's only one talk, but yeah, you, let's let's try to close in twenty five minutes or so. Okay. Um, yeah. But okay, please do keep asking questions though. If you uh, do. Or is, I mean, that's a function also of questions. If he gets many questions, I guess you should get some a little bit more. Yeah, I, I don't want to stop people asking questions, but yeah, also I, I don't want to not worry for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Also, we can also people can also just leave. I'm not, I won't be offended. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so what is this Q0? Uh, well, from the bound state argument, we should expect it to be roughly the operator with the smallest dimension to charge ratio in the theory. Th those are the things that form these completely stable bound states. And it's also clear if you define Q0 to be the charge of the lowest dimension to charge operator in the theory, then essentially the conjecture is automatically satisfied because then the dimension of NQ0 is to charge rate, dimension to charge ratio of NQ0 is going to be bigger. And then you just rearrange this and you get this, this behavior. So the really non-trivial statement is to do with Q0 being of order one. And this is capturing the weak gravity conjecture um, uh, uh, because um, remember the, the, the local operator is a dual also to multi-particle states in the bulk. So if you were to ask how can, let's say I had a particle which is self-attractive, you can ask how can I form the lowest dimension to charge ratio operator in the theory, well, you can just keep adding more and more of that particle because each time the the, you're going you're gonna to have a binding energy with, which is going to reduce the mass of the state. And so you, you keep reducing the mass to charge ratio. So in a, in a theory where you have a particle which is attractive, 
then the lowest dimension to charge ratio operator in the theory would be very, very high charge object. You just keep throwing more and more that particle in. On the other hand, a theory which has uh, an, a repulsive particle can have uh, a, a lowest uh, dimension to charge ratio operator in the theory, which has a very small charge. And that's why this is captured in the weak gravity conjecture. Um, can I just take one? I'm just going to take 20 seconds to switch to a, a different version of my talk. So I, I've given this talk quite a few times. Uh, and I have different versions according to the different expertise of the audience. <laughs> um, and now I have to go back to the version that's appropriate to here. Um, so let me, um, yeah, um, sorry, just, just one second. Uh, just because there's another comment I wanted to say. Okay, good. So, um, however, uh, so, so, so convexity, this, this convexity conjecture is imposed by so if you violate the weak gravity conjecture or the positive binding you violate convexity but it's not true the other way around convexity is a stronger statement than weak gravity or binding energy um, because it's essentially a statement about all the particle all the states in your theory um, includes one particle states as well but um, okay i won't go into this due to, to lack of time there's also a, you can formulate uh, a full a, a more general statement than the abelian version if you have non-abelian uh, global symmetries in the cft so this is the statement, consider a CFT with a continuous global group G and consider a simple factor G zero and G denote by delta R the dimension of the um, lowest dimension operator in representation R of G. Then there is always some representation R zero. So R zero is like Q zero before, um, which is non-trivial in G zero and has weights of order one. So that's like saying Q zero is order one. And then you have to look at the dimension of the operators of these operators delta tilde where you look at the Q symmetric product of the representation R0. So it, I, should not, I should not call this Q, but I should call it N. So like, instead of taking N times Q0 in the abelian case, now we look at the N symmetric product of the representation R0. Okay, that's the natural generalization. And then these operators must be convex. Um, okay, so. What does it mean weights of order one? The weights are order one. I mean, what, <laughs> you what, look what, at does the it, what does it mean? What does it mean? So it means like, like fundamental or the adjoint or something like this. So, not, yeah. Not you what? Not the so Dinkin level are not very large. This is what you mean. But large yeah. compared to what? Compared to what? Okay. So, the, the statement is it's the same question as you could ask about Q0. What do I mean by Q0 order one? And I think I'll make that statement. I don't know if it's in the next slide or so, but I can say it now anyway. What it means, like uh, precisely, is that it cannot be made parametrically large in any parameter of the CFT. Okay, so if you have some CFT, you have some parameters in that CFT, gauge coupling, n, large n, whatever, all these parameters, you cannot make Q0 parametrically large. Is, is that okay? Or is that? That's the sharp yes. statement. There's also stronger yes. versions which say something like, it must be uh, uh, the, the, the charge of the lowest uh, scalar charged operator and things like this, the stronger versions of the conjecture, but I won't go, I'll, I'll probably mention them at the end of the talk. But, but that's one sharp statement you can formulate. Okay, um, any more questions? Uh, okay, so let me move on to tests of the conjecture. So that, that's the motivation from the weak gravity conjecture and the precise formulation. And now we can just go and test it. Um, so before I do that, are there any questions about the formulation or the motivation? Okay, so let me make some general statements about CFTs and see how this fits in with some general CFT expectations. So now we just talk about CFT. We forget about gravity. We just talk about whether CFTs have a convex spectrum of charges. So whether CFTs have a spectrum of charges that satisfy this kind of behavior. This is actually called super additivity but it's basically like convexity. Um, so, okay, so what is true the following? If you take a sufficiently generic CFT and you take, look at the large charge sector, so that means large means large with respect to any parameter in the CFT, then the spectrum becomes convex. So this is, uh, uh, this large charge behavior behaves like this for operators in, in spectrum and D is bigger than D minus one. That means the second derivative is positive, A is positive, And so you get a convex spectrum. So for sufficiently large charge in any CFT that's sufficiently generic, you always get a convex spectrum. So the conjecture would be true. Um, what this also means is that if you take a completely strongly coupled CFT, a generic strongly coupled CFT, that means CFT that doesn't have any small parameters in it. Um, or any big parameters, 
then the large charge behavior kicks in at Q order one, like number order one, like 10 or something. And then a conjecture will automatically be satisfied. So that means the conjecture will be satisfied automatically in any sufficiently strongly coupled generic CFT. Um, you will always have a convex spectrum. So that's, that's a good place to start. If you have a non-generic CFT, you can have a supersymmetric CFT. Uh, then you can look at BPS states. Or if you have a free scalar theory, the same thing is true. You find that the spectrum is linear in the charge. So that means that it's still convex, but it's marginally convex. Um, so that's still OK. So BPS states also satisfied. Of course, if you have, a say, like the charge one state being BPS, charge two state is non-BPS, the spectrum will still be convex because uh, uh, not marginally, but, more, but positively convex, because remember the charge two state would not have twice the mass of the charge one state, but more than twice the mass, because that's what the BPS bound tells us, that the mass is always bigger than the charge for non-BPS state. So uh, BPS states were saturated, non-BPS states will satisfy convexity. Um, if you have two DCFTs, you actually can show that the spectrum behaves like this. So it looks like it's convex. It's a positive number times Q squared. But then it has contributions from what you might call, OK, I don't have time to go into this too much. But if you have a U1 and a two DCFT, you actually have two U1s, left moving and right moving. You have to look, you can look at just one sector, let's say, the left moving. And then you can gauge that U1. You call this then the CFT over the U1. And the spectrum behaves like this convex way, plus some contributions from this gauged CFT. And this looks convex because this contribution is convex, but it's a bit more subtle because it depends what this operator that you have to pair this charge with here. And in fact, I gave this talk last week and, and, and Rafa proposed um, uh, a possible counter example in two dimensions to the conjecture in the sense of, not, it's not saying that the spectrum is not convex generally, but he gave an example where you can make Q0 very, very large. So not so parametrically large. So it may be that in two dimensions, this conjecture may not be true, or at least that the fact that Q0 is order one cannot be, would not be true. Um, and this would actually match quite nicely onto the fact that 2D CFTs are due to 3D gravities, and 3D gravities are not proper gravities. So all this story that I told you about exchanging of gravitons and things like that doesn't work. There's no propagating degree of freedom associated to gravity in three dimensions. And similarly, um, uh, gauge fields in 3D theories can be made massive in the bulk and still correspond to U1 global symmetry. So three dimensions is a rather special case. Uh, and so this might be reflected in the fact that 2D CFTs might, um, this might not work for 2D CFTs. So to be the safest thing, we should restrict to 3D CFTs or higher. Um, let's think about free fermionic theories. Um, then the spectrum is not even marginally convex, as long as you take Q0 equal to the number of components of the fermions. And that's just because if, let's say, you have a fermion and you want to make a large charge operator, so you keep putting more and more of this fermion in, um, the Pauli's exclusion principle tells you you can't put too many of those fermions in because you cannot have twice a Grassmannian parameter. So if you want to make a large charge operator from fermions, you have to put in derivatives, derivatives into the operator. And derivatives increase the mass but don't increase the charge. So to make the spectrum more convex. So for example, this is what the spectrum of free fermionic theory in three dimensions looks like. Uh, the charge one and two operators have uh, dimension one and two, so that's marginally convex. But you see already charge three is no longer marginal. So let's say the, the dimension of, of charge two plus dimension of charge three is not even marginal with respect to dimension of charge five. So it's convex by order one parameters. And that means that if you take any uh, theory of uh, fermions, and you look at some perturbation about the free theory. So you have any kind of perturbative expansion, whether it's gauge coupling or large N or whatever, then you're just going to be doing some perturbation to this spectrum, and then it will stay convex. So any fermionic theory, which is perturbative, will satisfy convexity. Any theory which is non-perturbative will also satisfy convexity by the argument I just told you about large charge. So the only thing actually in fermionic theories that you can do to try and challenge the conjecture is to have a very large number of fermions. Because if you have a very large number of fermions, so the, the only parameter that can make Q0 large is if you have a very large is the number of fermions. Because if you have a large number of fermions in the spectrum, then you can make these large charge operators without putting derivatives in, because you have many different flavors and you don't have this Grassmannian problem anymore. So those are the only things that one can test. But if you have uh, an order one number of fermions in your theory, any theory, then it should have a convex spectrum. So that's that's a good check. Are there any questions about this? Oh. Okay, so that's the general statement. Now we can look at, at specific CFTs examples. So in specific CFTs, usually we have some weak coupling expansion. That's the only way we can calculate dimensions of operators. 
So what we want to look for is something like the dimension of phi to the n1 plus n2 minus the dimension of phi to the n1 plus dimension of phi to the n2. We call this gamma n1 n2, and this must be positive. That's what convexity, that's what the positive, that's what the convexity conjecture proposes, that in any CFT, this should be positive. And so let's look at some simple CFTs that we know. Uh, uh, so the simplest one you could think of, which has just the U1, is the Wilson Fisher fixed point in four minus epsilon dimensions. So this is the, what the CFT looks like. It has a fixed point at this coupling being epsilon over five. And then you can calculate the, um, actually it's not a really rigorous test because the theory does contain some non-unitary operators. Um, and we, are, we insist on unitary CFTs for the conjecture. But the interaction with unitarity is not completely clear. So it's worth um, studying these um, anyway. And uh, um, you can show that then if you look at the spectrum um, of these operators phi to the n, then you look at this gamma, it's indeed positive. So actually nice, this has only been calculated in that last two years. Um, so it was very lucky to have all these results that we can use and you, you'll see that throughout the whole uh, talk. And uh, therefore the spectrum is convex. Now this is true for n epsilon much smaller than one. If you make n epsilon much bigger than one, then you actually go into the large charge regime. And that's convex as well by the general large charge behavior. And you can even show that the spectrum is convex even through the kind of strong coupling intermediate regime using semi-classical method. So the spectrum is convex in fact for any n here. So throughout the whole uh, charge spectrum. So that's good. So this matches the conjecture. Let's look at another kind of theory. This is the O-N quartic model in four minus epsilon dimensions. Again, this has been calculated. You can just read it off the literature and you find that this is positive. So the spectrum is indeed convex. You can look at the U-1 and O-N sextic models in three minus epsilon dimensions. And again, you find that the spectrum is convex. Okay, so these are these, this is the family of those kind of models that we can, uh, kind of Wilson fiction models that we can do. Um, another method we can do, we can test with, so qualitatively different, is to do a large N expansion. And that's a bit nicer because then you can restrict to exactly three dimensions and you work with unitary theories. So you can look at the O-N quartic model at large N, then the spectrum, uh, the dimension of the operator charge Q looks like this. And you can read off convexity from the first nonlinear term, that's this quadratic piece. If that's positive, the spectrum is convex. And you see that it's positive, that means that the spectrum is convex for the ON quartic model in three dimensions. You can also calculate the dimensions for the ON quartic model in five dimensions, or the cubic model in six minus epsilon dimensions. Actually, the two are expected to be related by infrared uh, UV dualities. And there you see that the coefficient is negative. So the, the spectrum is not convex, so the conjecture is violated. Uh, this has a concave spectrum, the own model in five dimensions, but you can also show that those theories are precisely the ones which are non-unitary and in fact have no stable vacuum. And we'll see that there's a relation between unitarity, stability of the vacuum and convexity of the spectrum. So, so that's a nice check and the conjecture. When it is violated, you actually find that the theory um, doesn't have a, a vacuum, it's non-unitary. You can also look more recently, these people did this follow-up paper, um, uh, the UN times UN quartic model in four minus epsilon dimensions, and they find that again, this is convex. Sorry, so all the, these for the five dimensional yes. example before with a quartic coupling, why is it why is there no vacuum? You mean the, the, the sign of the quartic coupling becomes negative at the fixed point, or yes, no, it's do it's like the, there's to do with this non unitarity at large charge. So there are some operators which have a very large charge. That I think uh, um, that they they are non-unitary, so they lead to non-unitarity, and I think they also lead to instability of the vacuum. I'm not, I think the instability can be understood as some kind of non-perturbative effect. It's not a perturbative statement. Um, this is a yeah. So it's a strongly coupled theory, so it doesn't have such a perturbative instability. But yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but I think it's to do with the non-perturbative instability in terms of n. So I don't know the precise yeah. But you can look up these papers; they explain it. Uh, yeah. uh, so, sorry, Iran, but these theories have, I guess, Lagrangians which are perfectly okay, right? Yeah, they do have Lagrangians which are perfectly okay, but there is an instability. Uh, there is a non-unitarity instability which corresponds to very large charge operators. But I'm not, sorry, I, don't, I can't tell exactly uh, what, what it is precisely. Um, right, but this is, in a sense, telling you that when, when there is this violation, it's that it's correlated with unitarity, right? Yeah, so that we did, we didn't. Even, so I just added this factor of stability, but in our paper, we just talked about non-unitarity. So these are non-unitary theories, and this is a unitary theory. So it looks like it's exactly correlated non-unitarity. Okay. Yeah. 
So you can forget about vacuum stability. What we actually state in the paper is that we restrict to unitary theories. Yeah. Um, but the only reason I say this is because you know this mo this this model, the U1 model in form and form is also non-unitary theory, actually, as is shown here. But it does have a convex spectrum. And you can also see that the spectrum is the, the, the sign of it goes like epsilon, which goes like lambda. So if you flip the sign of lambda, so you look at it four plus epsilon, then you see that the spectrum becomes concave. But then that's precisely when you have an instability because the phi, phi to the four terms become negative. So this is an interesting situation. We have a non-unitary theory, and then you can see convexity is exactly related to stability of the vacuum. So that's why I'm not really sure exactly what it should be related to, but we insist on unitary theories. But it might be that there is a hint that maybe you can drop unitarity and, and assume stability, but I don't know yet. So that's the only reason I mentioned it. So, so those are two qualitatively different tests that the conjecture passed, the large N and the was a fiction. Let's look at a completely another qualitatively different type of theory. That's a gauge theory. So now we're going to look at something like Bank Sachs fixed point in four dimensions. So you can look at four-dimensional SUN gauge theory um, with NF massless firm and NS massless scalars. And this has a perturbative Bank Sachs type fixed point. Because you have scalars, you also have this quartic coupling. So you know you have to look for a fixed point not just of the gauge coupling, but also of the quartic interactions. And there are such fixed points, as, as was found here. And then you have this UNS global symmetry of the scalars in a the theory. And you can look at the operators uh, charged under this global symmetry. So these would be these meson operators. OK, so you can look at the charge N one, which has uh, this meson charge uh, to the power of charge N. And no, this is not phi dagger phi. Phi dagger phi would be uh, a, a singlet under the global for, I mean, under the flavor symmetry. So you have to take two different flavors here, and then you get essentially the adjoint representation. And you look at n copies of the adjoint representation. Um, and this was not calculated, actually. So we calculated in the paper for the first time. We did it at one loop. And one finds the following result, that the dimension of the two meson operator take away twice the dimension of the one meson operator is proportional with a positive constant to the sum of the quartic uh, coefficients. And so there's something very subtle here. You would expect a gauge coupling contribution. This is a gauge theory. So you would expect the gauge contribution to the normalized dimension, but you can show that it precisely cancels and you only get a contribution from these quartic terms, coefficients. And this quartic coefficients must be positive because otherwise you don't have a stable vacuum. And you can show that. So any fixed point with stable vacuum has precisely this combination positive. So again, we see this relation between vacuum stability and convexity. So since this might be positive to be able to uh, um, a stable vacuum, then the spectrum must be convex. This must be bigger than twice this. So that's the qualitatively third qualitatively different test we've done. Here's now a fourth qualitatively different test, completely different kind of theory, completely different kind of operators. So you can look at three-dimensional gauge theories with NF fermions. This flows to a CFD in the infrared. It has a U1 topological global symmetry that's um, uh, the, 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 the global symmetry whose current is dual to the field strength of the gauge field, and the operators charged under it are monopole operators. It's a strongly coupled theory, but at large NF, you can calculate the dimension of the monopole operators using semi classical methods. And this is what they did, and this is the spectrum they find. And you see that this spectrum is convex at large NF. So, you know, twice this is less than this, and so on and so on. So, again, you find 3D gauge theories with monopole spectrum, the spectrum is convex. So, completely qualitatively different to everything we discussed so far. Again, you find convexity. You can do a similar thing in three dimensions without, not instead of fermions with scalars. And the scalars can have be with or without quartic terms. If they don't have quartic terms, it's what's called a tricritical model. If they do, it's what's called a CPN model. This is the spectrum of monopole operators people calculate, and you see that it's convex. You can also look at the QED uh, uh, with fermions, but now not free fermions, fermions with a quartic cross never type coupling. And you find, indeed, that the spectrum is, again, convex. You can also add Chern-Simons terms to these theories at level k, and you can calculate the monopole spectrum, and you find that the Chern-Simons terms only increase convexity of the spectrum. So all the results we have so far just become more and more convex as you turn on the Chern-Simons interactions. So all the Chern-Simons theories are also convex. Um, so this is really a, a very large number of different qualitatively different checks. Um, OK, and then I have a couple of slides about whether Q0 can be the smallest charge. It's not so important. I'll just make a slight comment here that if you look at strongly coupled theories, completely strongly coupled theories, like the O2 model in three dimensions, 
Then the, 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 this is my last slide. Then the, um, the, the conjecture will always be satisfied for any strongly coupled theory from the argument I just told you, because at large Q, you enter large charge regime and the spectrum is convex. But you could look at strong versions of the conjecture. So these are two things that are consistent with all the theories we found so far, that Q0 should be the charge of the lightest charged operator, okay, the one with the smallest dimension, or that Q0 should be the charge of the smallest scalar operator charge. So you look at all the scalar operators and you take the smallest charge of those. Those are consistent with everything we know so far. And if you do those, then you can test them non-trivially in strongly coupled theories, okay? Because then you're making a statement, a very strong statement. And so this is an example of a strongly coupled theory, the OT model in 3D, and you can calculate its spectrum by various methods like lattice, bootstrap, uh, five loop or six loop calculations. And this is a spectrum that you find. And indeed you see that the spectrum is convex. So twice times one is less than two, one plus two is less than three and so on. So even in these strongly coupled theories, you find the spectrum is exactly convex. And then I'll make a slight comment that it's quite interesting because this theory is actually the theory which describes very nicely the superfluid transition in helium. And so um, these things are actually experimentally measurable. So you can, you can really measure the, the dimension of some of these operators and you can measure the, the, the value of the couplings from the critical exponents. So um, this theory, which has a convex spectrum, is a theory that can be realized in the lab, in the experiment. And so it, it makes a nice connection with possibly experimentally realizable systems and, and predictions. So to summarize. Can you, can you uh, measure charged? I don't think you can right? measure. I don't think you can measure charged operators. Right? No, but well, you can, you can derive the spectrum through the theory. You can't measure them directly. So what you can measure is the couplings from the, the critical from the critical exponent, calculate the spectrum from the theory. That, that's what this calculation show here. This is a, you did a five loop calculation and you calculate the spectrum. So you cannot measure them directly, uh, at least to, not with any method that I know of yet. Is that okay? Is that? Yeah, no, that's, that's what I wanted to That's what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, this operator here, which has this experimental value is the singlet. Uh, yes, it's a singlet exactly. Yeah. But of course, first of all, you can measure them by numerical, by lattice, it's about, by Monte Carlo simulations. Um, and secondly, if you do understand the theory, then, you know, the five loop calculation relates for you the, the critical sure. exponents with the, with the spectrum, of course. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we propose that the natural formulation of, but, but the interesting thing is, of course, that there is a convex spectrum and it's a theory that's realizable by in an experiment. So, of course, the, the idea is that, the idea is that, of course, any phase transition is described by some CFT. And then if you have a really general statement about the spectrum of CFTs, maybe this can be mapped to phase transitions for which we don't understand the theory, but convexity can still tell you something about that physics. So that's the idea, but I don't know how to exactly realize that, of course. So to summarize, we propose that the natural formulation of the weak gravity conjecture is in terms of the binding energy of a particle. It's especially important in ADS, where it's qualitatively different to the usual formulation of the weak gravity conjecture. This leads to a CFT dual statement, which is that the spectrum of charge operators should be convex. Seems to hold in all the examples we tested so far, um, at least demanding unitarity and possibly stability of the vacuum. I need to keep testing it. I should say that there was this possible counterexample in two dimensional CFTs. Um, so it may be that in 2D CFTs, the statement that Q0 is order one is not true. Of course, you will have convexity eventually, but the question is whether you can do it to Q0 order one. So it may be that we have to restrict to, to, to three dimensions or higher, which is where the gravity dual is propagating as a real gravity theory. Um, there's an opportunity for a proof because you know, CFTs are much better defined than quantum gravity theories. So in principle, you could imagine proving convexity in CFTs. Of course, that will then prove the weak gravity conjecture, or at least this formulation of the weak gravity conjecture in ADS. So that's a nice thing. Um, and as I said, it could be a possibility of making contact with experimentally realizable systems, um, uh, with CFTs, and, and, and possibly maybe make predictions or tests. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Well, that really nice yeah. talk. Thanks for, sorry for running a couple of minutes. But no no problem bad. at all. Yeah. So we have time for further questions. Uh, can I ask uh, one more yeah. question? Um, if this is true in general in a CFT, there must be some reason for it to be true. Do you understand why? What's the intuition behind it? 
Well, no, otherwise we wouldn't call it a conjecture. But uh, I can tell you, I've been giving this talk quite a few times now, and like some people gave me various ideas. Like, for example, um, when I gave this talk in India, I think Gupakama raised the idea that it could be related to... So if you think of the partition function, you can pull down the charge and the energy of the states by taking derivative respect to the chemical potential and the temperature. And then you can try to rewrite it in terms of uh, uh, derivatives of the partition function respect to chemical potential and temperature. And then you could try to use certain thermodynamic identities, like um, the kind of positivity statement to do with compressibility, I don't know, or something like this. So maybe this is one way one can try to show it, but we don't have any ideas, really. For example, uh, and also I think the related question is why the existence of the global charge is important. Suppose I take any two operators of the CFT and I define the same convexity requirement, that is, I take the product and then uh, you can say whether it's bigger or smaller compared to the uh, sum of the two anomalous dimensions. What's special about the charged operator? Yeah, but it's, it's, I mean, like for sure, it cannot hold for any else. Because like I said, if you take, instead of you take five, instead of taking the meson phi, phi of squared. Course, you look of at, course, of course it doesn't. But the question is what's special about the charge? Well, it's just the state. Well, like I said, if you motivate it, I don't know, but if you motivate it from the weak gravity conjecture statement, of course, we made a very big leap here because we, we looked at CFT with holographic duels, and then we made this wild leap where we, where we, meant, we said, okay, maybe it's true in all CFTs. I mean, I, I went through the talk a bit quickly, but I hope I made that clear. That's a huge jump, okay? So let's say we make that jump, but then the motivation on the gravity side is clear. You know, if you take uh, the, everything I told you about, uh, the charge is crucial for the stability of the states. If you just take a bound state of any two particles with no charge, that will just decay to some gravitons or something. First of all, uh, you shouldn't use the the language of particles because you are in a CFT and this is not a good language. No, no, so I'm trying to talk about the gravity motivation here. From the CFT, I do not know. But from the gravity side, you can see why the charge is important. So the U1 gauge charge is very important because that's what guarantees the stability of the state. Oh, you want to and that U1 gauge that? charge is mapped to the U1 global charge in the CFT. Now you can ask from the purely CFT side, why, why is it? Then that's much less clear. But from the gravity side, it's clear that you need the, the U1 gauge charge. That's what guarantees the stability of these objects that you want to avoid. You want some selection rule that prevents the identity to be there in the OP at any rate. Yeah, yeah so that, that of course is, yeah, that's is what I just said also to Monica, that if you take phi, dag phi, phi bar, that is uh, for sure not convex. In fact, but, let, let, me, let me rephrase it differently. The main difference is that if you take the operator product expansion of your two, let's say, elementary operators, is the question is whether you have singular terms in the OP or not, right? Yeah, that's exactly what it maps to. Uh, and the question is, where does this make a difference? Yeah, so I do, I do not know. I mean, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so one, one thing you could try to prove is that there's no singular terms in OPEs of uh, operators with, with a charge under the U1 global symmetry. But that, that, that's just rephrasing the conjecture. I don't know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know a, what. Let's take another question from uh, Gustas. He has raised his yeah. hand. Hi, Aaron. This is simply a side question. I got the... Can you show again the table with uh, the helium exponents? Yes. Just, uh, the... It's a curiosity. Uh, there seems to be a many sigma uh, disagreement between theory and experiment for uh, the first operator. Yes, there is. It's a well-known uh, issue. These well, are very hard experiments to do, actually. Yeah. So their error bar is uh, underestimated. Is this what you're saying? So there is. The so in this. This is not my field at all, but I did read some of the literature on this. It's very interesting. Uh, so the, O2, the O2 model on 3D is supposed to describe this phase transition of helium, the so-called lambda point. Um, but there is a disagreement, uh, which is actually the one you said. There's a, a certain sigma disagreement with experiment measurement. People I spoke to say that that's because the experiment was not done precisely enough, but it's a difficult experiment. Um, but uh, this is all I can say, yeah. So uh, I don't know if that means that the theory is wrong or the experiment is wrong, but there is some disagreement, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a difficult experiment. It's actually done in space because gravitational, so I have a picture of it. 
here. There it is. It's, it's, uh, it's, I looked into this because it's not my field, so I got interested in it. So yeah, you can measure, for example, the dimension of this operator that's measured here is related to this psi, which is just a critical exponent of the density of the fluid as you approach the, the transition point. And this is so important, so hard to measure this, that gravitational effects are important. And so you have to do it in the space shuttle. And of course, that you can't do that every year. So it's done 10 years ago, and then it's not been done since then. So this, this measurement is 10 years old or so, I think. So, yeah. Aaron? Thanks. Yes? Yeah. Could you comment on the, on the relation or analogy between this convexity in charge and convexity in spin? Yeah, so of course in spin, you can actually prove that there is convexity and the spectrum, uh, the so-called twist, uh, the spin twist, so the angular momentum uh, take away. And um, uh, but as far as we can tell, there's no relation. Um, also in spin, the convexity goes to zero for spin at high spin. Whereas for charge, it goes to not zero. It goes to the large charge behavior, right? So this is not zero convexity. Uh, what do you mean by zero that. convexity? You, you mean it saturates the, the inequality? Yes, for spin, I think it, it becomes like just uh, convex. I mean, like the saturate this inequality. Yeah, well, here it doesn't because this doesn't become uh, goes to linear. It doesn't become linear at large yeah. charge. But there is still universal behavior. So if you subtract instead of the charge, you subtract the charge to d to the d minus one. Then indeed, also convexity goes away for charge at large charge. So. Maybe there's a way to relate this to the spin story, but not anything that we could think of. Yeah. Convexity in spin is uh, rigorously established from uh, yeah. the uh, 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 axioms. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. So, of course, it would be very nice if you could, but I don't see any way to do it. But yeah, <laughs> um, we, are aware, we are aware, of course, of convexity in spin, but we couldn't think of any connection. OK. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have one more question. You formulated it in a CFT, uh, which is in a way which is well defined. But do you know what this conjecture would be in a QFT? Where the anomalous dimensions make sense only. No, so that's also an interesting question. Hmm? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. I think, like, from the gravity side, you can imagine putting the particles in, on a boundary and asking if they form a state. And then you somehow, if you modify the theory in the bulk, then it may not matter. So one suggestion somebody made in one of my talks is that perhaps it should be true. You know, if, if, you, have a, if you have a QFT that is a flow by some relevant operator, some operator from some CFT, perhaps it will still be maintained convexity. But I don't have any idea in general. But well, you want to have dilution, yeah, this is beyond. What I mean, I mean, there's many questions like this. Yeah, yeah. But what, okay. what I meant is that if you have a QFT, which is some flow between two CFTs, the anomalous dimensions are well defined either near the UV or near the IR. And of course, since these are the anomalous dimensions of the CFTs, uh, they should satisfy the, um, the conjecture. But the question is: Well, if it's mono, if the flow is monotonic, then yes. But it doesn't have to be monotonic. I mean, what flow? Like a free. What do you mean by flow? The dimension. The, the dimensions do not flow in a, in because they're not well defined away from the scaling regions. You can define them either in the UV or in the IR, but not in between. If you try to define them in the between, this is a scheme-dependent concept. Okay, but I mean, you can still calculate, you know, in, when I do quantum field theory course, so you calculate the anomalous dimension, it just did a one loop, you do a loop by loop order. Okay, there is some scheme dependence, it's true, but. Okay, fine. I mean, the, people calculate anomalous dimensions in quantum field. Of course, theory. but they never, yeah. they never <laughs> use them other than, you know, uh, understand what happens in scaling regions. And the question of Elias was whether this convexity property is preserved by RG flow, right? So, yeah, I mean, if you need or, Well, not only that, how you formulate it, first of all, because as I said, the anomalous dimension as a function of the of new, the, the normalization group scale is not well defined. You have to define it precisely to make any claim of that sort. Or yeah. you have to formulate well, that... it in terms of something that's physical or well defined in terms of a correlator or something. 
Yeah, I do not know. These are good questions. A similar questions like what happens if there's boundary safeties? Are there any concerns convexity there or right. any convexity from non relativistic safeties? We do not know. I mean, this is all completely unexplored. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Very good. So, if Yosif could stop the recording, meanwhile, we can.